Welcome to Paper Quest. I'm Jesse. And I'm James. And we're two friends teaming up in our ongoing quest through the Infinite Library. Each episode, we get together to discuss our latest buddy read, swap stories on our recent solo reads, and talk about the upcoming books we look forward to reading next. This is Paper Quest. <laughs> So we will jump right into how we usually do these things and start with the books that we are currently reading. And I can honestly say I don't know what you're reading right now. So do you want to start? Sure. <laughs> um, so I, I'll i start with the, the impromptu one, which was, it's a, called the Wild Mountain Scots series by Jolie Vines. Um, it is a set of romance novels that are on Kindle Unlimited and... I don't know how many there are, but it's one of those things where, you know, there's the first book and you meet some side character and then they build off of that side character Mm -hmm. and do the next book. Um, So it's basically uh, these women meet men who are in the Scotland mountain rescue. Um, So whether like one of them like... um, is being stalked or being blackmailed or whatever. And for whatever reason, their paths cross and they help each other and fall in love. That's a very different and distinct specific location and setting. (laughs) It is. Very much so. But it's actually interesting because they're talking about things that I don't know a lot about. And I'm, and they're actually, uh, written in with like a Scottish brogue. So it says instead of like baby, it says, like, B-A-I-R-N. Well, when we read the the um, Irish mystery novel, yeah, yeah. I, that's the what we, I came across, like, a different language and words that I was not used to, like, hearing. So that's always fun to discover. Yeah. Um, so I've been working through those just randomly. I, I've said this in the past. I like just having something on my phone in case I'm stuck somewhere or don't have a physical book. Um, so... I happen to just read those. Well, that's about where I... the My first book I'll mention is that exact scenario of which I listen to this when I'm walking or doing whatever. Um, you've read it, The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. We reviewed The Silent Patient earlier. Mm-hmm. Same guy, same author. Uh, it's a psychological mystery novel. I don't quite think I'd call it a psych thriller. But uh, we have Mariana who is uh, a group therapist. Uh, she's got, I think it's more of a side story right now, but she has someone who's kind of stalking her from the group therapy session. But the main part of the story is that her niece, Zoe, has this friend who goes to Cambridge University who is uh, murdered. And the premise of the book is that Mariana, the main character, is convinced, despite his alibi, that the teacher, uh, Mr. Fosca... Edward Fosca is the killer and there ends up being a second murder and both students are from Fosca's lecture from his class. He's a Greek tragedy professor. And I, I don't know how this book ends. I think there's a twist or surprise ending. I don't, I'm not sure, but I feel like Mariana is going real hard on this, and I feel like it's not going to end well for her, but we'll see. I'm about halfway through it right now. Very interesting. I'm almost positive I'm giving it three out of five stars. It's a very good, interesting novel. It's nothing mind-blowing, but it's fun. I like it. Nice. Yeah, I'll be interested. Fun in quotes, because it's horrible. Yeah, it's it's about murder. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I will be very interested to hear your thoughts once you've finished it. Um. So the other book I just finished, and this is like, again, if you watch any booktube or book TikTok, um, it's been said a hundred times, so I won't harp on it too much, but I listened to Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, um, and it was great. It's a full cast audiobook. Love it. um, And the cast, I started looking them up, is like... One of them's from Game of Thrones. One like there are stars that you see um, regularly, like okay. um, character actors and stuff. Um, and what it basically is is 1970s rock band Daisy Jones is 
um, kind of like a solo artist, socialite, um, and she gets a record deal, and the Six is already an established band, and they're on the same label, and the label basically goes, oh, what if we put you guys together? And then all the things that happen this, in the 70s play out, you know, drugs, addiction, sex. Um, they talk about so many things, but, be, but it's written in interview style. Mm. So they'll be, you know, they'll be just like, someone has just described um, a concert, and then you'll just have a voice pop in for like two seconds to be like, yeah, it was amazing. And then it like be the next person to talk more in depth about it. Um, there's one person whose um, name in the story is Karen Karen. And she's like, <laughs> she she's explaining that her name was Karen something. And the person she was introducing herself to just heard her say Karen. And then they said, what? And she said, Karen again. And that became her name. And then like he is talking, she's saying that he goes and talks about it. And she goes, by the way, my name is Karen Jones or whatever her last name is. Um, so it was, it's just fun to listen to. And it was a great ending. Like do it had you, me in tears, like bawling. Do you do lots of audio dramas? Um, I don't. Each month, uh, there's a, there's a company called Big Finish and I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. And each month they put out a couple Doctor Who releases that are mm-hmm. canon to the show. So I listen to audio dramas like every week. I love them. Yeah. It was really good, and it was fast, and it was fun, um, and I would highly recommend. I definitely, I give it five stars for sure. Yeah, and and when you can have it just an audio drama form, it just makes it more exciting. You, you just get rid of all the, he said, she said. It's all full cast. I love all that. Yeah. It's it's a lot. It's it's just a it's a TV in your head, as they say. Well, every time I saw it online, people were like, "You have to listen to the audiobook." So I've had it on hold at my library for like, I don't know, four months. And I finally got it, and I was like, "Yes, this is what I'm doing." <laughs> uh, I am reading, and this is this is going to get stale as I say this every episode. But I'm reading every Brandon Sanderson novel, and I see that's going to get stale because they're big and it's going to take a while. So I'll be yeah. saying this a lot. But I just finished Elantris. It's his first published novel, and it's technically the first Cosmere book he wrote. I'm doing a separate podcast and a separate side quest for all these things. I'll go more in depth. I won't go too far in here. But Sanderson is known for his world building and magic systems. But what makes the first book so interesting is that, or his first published book so interesting is that he has developed a magic system, but the whole point of the book is that it hasn't worked in 10 years. The book starts 10 years after the downfall of Elantris and the magic system doesn't work and no one knows why and no one knows how to fix it. And basically Elantris is... If Elantris, the magic of Elantris, it chooses who becomes an Elantrian. Your skin turns silver, your hair turns stark white, and it was considered to be um, an honor to become an Elantrian. No one knows how you get picked. You can be royalty, you can be a peasant, whatever. You're picked, and you get to go to Elantris, um, and you can use magic and all that stuff. But ever since the magic system broke, anyone who gets chosen as an Elantrian instead becomes like, splotchy and gross and something's wrong with you and they send you away to Elantris and you're trapped there for your entire life um, because you you can't die there's something I'll go more in depth in the in the episode but there's something really cool going on and he's known for his like really fun surprising sometimes twist endings but it's just cool to read a magic you know fantasy novel in which the magic itself does not work yeah that is very interesting so it's like I, I, you learn the rules of the magic as you go along, but no one's using it. <laughs> Are you reading anything else? Um, so I just got the Invisible Life of Addie Larue from my library, which I've also been on hold for for a long time. <laughs> um, and that is also a book talk booktube book. Um, and I'm like ten pages in, but the premise is is that this woman's about to die she makes a deal with the devil and so anytime she leaves someone's sight they forget her so she lives forever but like you know she goes to the bathroom or she walks behind the person and they don't know who she is anymore um and kind of how she's dealing with that and people it is v.e schwab who did the um 
was it Darker Shades of Magic? Darker Shades of Magic um, books, one that we reviewed together, and then you did a side quest about all three of them. And so I'm a little hesitant because, like, although I liked the first Darker Shades of Magic book, I didn't love it. And I've heard that this book is polarizing and you love it or hate it and there's no in between. So we'll see how it goes. But I've been on hold for a long time, so I'm going to see it through. <laughs> okay. I <clears throat> The only things that I've read by Schwab is that trilogy. Mm-hmm. So I'm very curious to think about, or I'm very curious to know what you have to say about another book of hers. Um, hers, right? Is she? Yeah, 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 hers. I think. I have many thoughts on that author based on just that trilogy. But yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, I have one more. It's a novella. It takes place in the same world as Elantris. He has a bunch of... Uh, Brandon Sanderson has a bunch of short stories that fit into all of his different uh, series. This one's called The Emperor's Soul. Uh, it takes place on Cell. This is the same planet that Elantris takes place on. <clears throat> and it has a different magic system, which... Technically, it shouldn't make any sense, because why would there be two different magic systems? Again, I can't wait to explain that. It's a lot of fun. This magic system works, though. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. This is a short book. I think it's just under 200 pages. It's a novella. But they there's there is these people called Forgers, with a capital F, like, like a job title almost. Mm-hmm. And the main character, whose name I forget because it's weird and I totally didn't write it down... The main character is this girl. She's a forger. She gets caught. She gets thrown in prison. It's the day before her execution. And she's called upon for a job. They cancel ex- They cancel the execution because they need her help with something. So there's these things called soul stamps. I, can't, I haven't quite figured out what they look like or anything. It's a very weird description. But let's just say, as an example from the book, you have a plain, ordinary door. But you want it to look really regal and fancy. Someone like a forger can create a soul stamp. It takes a long time to do, but they can copy, say, like a, an amazing, beautiful door from an actual palace. And once that stamp is created, you can put it on the door somewhere, and it takes on that appearance, basically. Okay. Um, they use examples like changing a piece of pottery, um, forging artwork, stuff like that. And the whole point of the story, as I know it so far, is that the Emperor, it's called the Emperor's Soul, so the Emperor is assassinated in the middle of the night, and they want to soul stamp him. They've hired the girl to recreate the Emperor using his same body, and it's put, <clears throat> something like that takes, like, they're going to have to go through the, the Emperor's journals, talk to people he knew, stuff like that. It should take maybe three years, the Forger is guesstimating, but they only have 100 days to do it before um, people realize what happened. Because he's a, he's in a 100-day mourning period, but he's died during this period. So there's they have 100 days to do it until the popula- population realizes there's something wrong. Interesting. So not very far into it. Very crazy magic system. Uh, really exciting. Nice. So we're going to jump right into this episode's book, which is The School for Good and Evil by Summon... Chinani? A quick summary of the book. Where do fairy tales come from? How do their stories begin? How is one's place in a fairy tale decided? Why they attend the school, for good and evil, of course. Every four years, the headmaster arranges a kidnapping from various locations around the realm. They are sorted into good and evil and marched off to one of the two opposing castles that stand side by side, connected by a large bridge in the middle. It is here that students will learn the role in the fairy tale life. Whether they are good enough to become the next prince or princess, or evil witch and scary sorcerer, Sophie has dreamed her whole life of being kidnapped and taken to the school for good, a princess in the making. She practices her good deeds every day, including visiting Agatha, the ugly witch-like girl that has no friends and is looked down upon. On the night of the kidnapping, Sophie Sophie and Agatha are both chosen by the headmaster and are flown away to their respective future schools. But what happens when they get dropped off at the wrong castle? Sophie is horrified to learn she's been dropped off at the school school for evil, whereas Akatha has taken her place at the school for good. So this book is written for third grade to seventh graders. And lucky enough, I have a, uh, a child in that demographic. So for this book, I attempted to read aloud to him. Um, so this is my son, Danny. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and 
Um, we only got through about uh, a little bit of the book <laughs> with him um, because I didn't realize how long it takes to read out loud. So we figure he can give us some insight. Danny, what did you think of the, pr- the premise for the book? I thought it was, I wouldn't say bad, but unique Okay. in a way, sorts, because Sophie and Agatha were both placed in different schools. Yes, it's true, it's a pretty big premise, but there's barely any boys. Yeah, they don't talk about boys a lot in the start yeah. of the book, do they? <clears throat> but they, like you said, Sophie, what is Sophie like when you meet her? What is she like? Sophie um, is trying to be good, but is trying too hard and is taking a wrong turn to evil. And she actually wants to be in the school for good. While Agatha, um, even though she wasn't picked, she was trying to save Sophie from it. Um, you can look at that from the book. But, yeah, she was trying to save Sophie from the treacheries of the school. So she didn't want her best friend to be kidnapped. Yeah, so she was placed in the school for good. Yeah, so Sophie went to the school for evil, like James said, and Agatha went to the school for good. What was Agatha like? Agatha... What did she wear? She wore pink. Which... So, no, Sophie wore pink. Agatha's the more witch-like one, remember? Oh, right. So I'm guessing she wore tattered clothes. Yep. And lots of very uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. She liked spooky stuff, right? Yeah. And so do you think this type of story would be a good movie? Um... Yes, if you put it in a movie, it'd be very good. And yet, it is going to be in a movie someday. It is. What did you think about the parts that we read? Would you want to keep reading that with me? Mm. And see what happens? Yes. It's a very fun little book. And then, when you actually looked at it, was it easy for a fourth grader to read? Or was it not so easy? I... uh, It was a pretty easy book to read, but um, it has some big words that um, some people may not know how to pronounce. That's a good point. So it might be a little bit higher than of a reading level. Yeah, so maybe more for sixth grade than fourth grade. But, yeah. How many stars would you give the parts that you heard? Out of five. Uh, um, a three. A three? So mm-hmm. you want to keep reading it, but it's not like the most amazing thing you've ever heard? Yeah, more like a a, a 3.5. Awesome. Any other last thoughts? Nah, but yeah, it's a great book. Um, People should definitely go check it out. And... um. Watch our other videos before you watch this. You mean listen? Yeah. Listen. <laughs> listen to other episodes of the podcast? hmm Since you haven't heard the ending, do you think they were put in the right schools? Yes, I feel like they have. Okay. Because, as I said before, Agatha was more nice, and so th- Sophie was more mean. And one of the characters that you will see... Is the spiky-haired boy in the School for Evil? You'll check him out. Mm. Were you interested in him? Yeah, he was, like, very weird, but very nice. Well, thank you for giving us your opinion. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, so let's jump into your thoughts initially, spoiler-free, on the School for Good and Evil. Yeah, so I was interested in this um, just even as an adult. I enjoy, uh, if you've been listening to these podcasts, I enjoy basically any magic system set in a school. (laughs) Um, 
but I really do like the the idea of these two opposite friends that are put into the wrong schools. Um, and I liked that from the very beginning, you saw that everyone else thought of the school of good and evil as either not existing um, or... Terrified. Um, yeah, <laughs> horrible. Like, the parents were, like, barricading their doors and locking their children in. And Sophie, pink and princessy, is like, I'm going to do my cucumber mask, and I'm going to get my hair did, and I'm going to open the window and wait for him to come and kidnap me. Her father's, like, locking doors, and she's unlocking them. Yeah. Um, so it was it was fun. Um, I... Do think, like Danny said, it's a little bit high of a reading level. There was some things where I even was like, what is that word? <laughs> well, it's it hits those childish fantasy notes of like, well, now we're just making things up. Yeah. Like, there's just random nonsense where it's like, even I was like, yeah, I don't, you know, we're just having fun here with these, these crazy scenarios. Yeah. Well, in some scenarios, maybe because I'm an adult, was really... Um, Maybe more for a seventh grader than like an eight or nine year old. Um, so that just might be something to consider depending on the child you're reading to. My biggest takeaway in the first note that I wrote actually for the whole thing was that, you know, I still read kids books to these days. There are kids books that are written for kids that anyone can read. And then there are kids books like this that are just meant for kids for sure, where it's just like, Really crazy scenarios, ridiculous things, super fairy tale-y, and like, you know, there there are more than one there are multiple fart jokes in this. I'm just like, yeah, this this is the this is the kids book meant for kids and not maybe so much for me. Yeah, so I will say that was one of my notes, and it's not a spoiler at all. <laughs> um but basically Agatha gets dropped into the school of good and she's surrounded by all these princesses and in her brain she's just like what do I do what do I do because they're all looking at her and she farts and um I was reading that part to Danny and it was like a good 15 minutes of just bent over like laughter he could not handle it um and so yeah there is quite a bit of that yeah um again maybe think about who <laughs> who you're reading to. <laughs> um, but no, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It's fun. Yeah. Um, I recommend it for kids and adults. Um, again, with the knowledge that it is written for kids. <laughs> so. Yeah, very much so. And I'm going to say, just as a heads up, this book, I was in and out. Like, I, I read it all the way through, but I was zoning in and zoning out. And I know I was like, ah, I know I read something. I forget what that scenario was. I forget that character's name. It's very possible you're going to mention a scenario and I'd be like, yeah, I don't remember that. Because I was just kind of like, this is a kid's book for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're our age and, and you know, close to 30, somewhere around there, um, and you're watching... I don't know, Barney and friends, it's not always um, mentally stimulating. Yeah. So. I did like, <clears throat> when we first get introduced to Sophie, she's like the first thing that happens in the book. I was already, she has this checklist of like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this and do that because that's what I'm supposed to do as a good person. I'm going to visit Agatha because I guess I have to, it's princessly of me or whatever. And I was like, oh, she really doesn't seem like someone who should go to like this. Like she, she seems kind of just self-absorbed. And so when we get the immediate twist of them getting dropped off to the wrong schools, she's like, you made a mistake. And I was like, oh, this book is about them definitely not making a mistake. Like yeah. the premise got me really excited and, and what follows is fun too. But when I realized <clears throat> the point of the book, like I thought we were just going to go to a school and they were going to learn magic. But when I realized there was a twist and they put evil and good and good and evil, I was like, Okay, I can get behind this. This is going to be fun. All right. Yeah, I never thought they were in the wrong school. Yeah. Neither did Danny, by the way. I, I started taking um, recordings of him after each chapter that we read um, so that I could use it in preparation for this with him. Um, 
And right away, he was like, why is Sophie doing that? That's not nice at all. Mm -hmm. Like, um, right in the beginning, she brings Agatha muffins and tells Agatha that they're the good muffins, but really they're made out of bran. And he's just like, that's mean. Why would you <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> so. All right. Well, we'll just jump into spoilers and talk about whatever we want to talk about. Sounds good. Um, so, like oh, okay. we mentioned, Sophie and Agatha are kidnapped and they are dropped into two separate schools and immediately we see the vast difference between the schools um so sophie is dropped into a stinky muddy like moat situation and she's covered in gook and grime and um wolves with whips (laughs) um get them kind of in a line and um get all the kids inside whereas agatha pops up from a flower (laughs) <laughs> and fairies lift her up and bring her into the castle. I mean, I just don't know. I guess if the if the universe has decided you're a bad person, then you're a bad person in this in this realm. But I was like, yeah, these kids have no chance. They're just treated like garbage when they hit the bad school. Like, yeah. of course they're going to be evil. Everything that happens is horrible. Well, and something I thought that was interesting is that Sophie and Agatha are the only two quote unquote readers. So they're the only kids who are not from a fairy tale family. I was gonna ask you about this. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but I think even as a kid's book, I think something failed to register for me. There was a, a mention of why is no one why is there no one outside of the village? Beyond the woods or something. Yeah. What are they implying? Are they, are they saying, like, obviously people exist. They're all in the school. What were they implying? So there is the fairy tale land. Yeah. The woods. And then this one village gaveled on that Sophie and Agatha are from. Mm-hmm. Sophie and Agatha believed that there was the rest of the world. I think what the schoolmaster and the people who were talking about it were implying was that's the only town. Oh, there's nothing else beyond the woods yeah. not that there's nothing beyond the woods just besides them right okay gotcha but yes that was a little confusing the way that they're wording it but <clears> i think <throat> it might be because there's multiple um books after this one uh i think that it might be setting up for something. it's it's definitely a lingering plot line that kind of gets dropped after a while because there's there's the hallways with the pictures and there's lots of things going on about like their their location and I'm like clearly if I read more there is there's more to that story mm-hmm. but I was wondering if I just missed it in this first one. Yeah. Um so let's see. Can we talk about how easy it is to get away with anything in this school? Like sure. I felt like it was so important that these two schools are like hard to get into. Like They sneak out so much and get into their school in so many ways. I'm like, don't teachers realize that the second they learn how to transform into a cockroach, they're going to get away with a lot of things. (laughs) Yeah, so one thing that is interesting is the schools have overlapping schedules. So they have lunch together and they have, um, like, I forget what it's called, but basically like Like forest survival class. Okay, yeah, and the theater. Yeah, and the theater um, that they all interact in. And they are connected in into intra school but they are also connected by a bridge and the bridge has a barrier and basically agatha very quickly realizes that if she walks up she speaks to her reflection and her reflection says no you're good you can't come across and she goes um you know i'm i'm plotting to um ruin the ball or whatever the thing is and they're just like oh that is bad and they let her in so I thought that that was, like, really interesting. Yeah. the Really easy to figure out. <laughs> the stakes were low, even in the end game, if you will, um, because literally anything can and will happen. It's one of those magic stories where magic works because magic. There's no, mm-hmm. like, there's no magic system. There's no rules. It's highly fairy tale. It's just, like, anything could happen, and you just have to roll with it. Yeah, so we actually don't, besides the fact that, she says she's studying the classes. Agatha very quickly surpasses Sophie in knowing how to transform herself, understanding all that's happening in the school, um, knowing how to do spells for both the school of evil and the school of good because she's help it, trying to help Sophie. And actually, 
her whole goal is to get them both home. Sophie's whole goal is for them to switch schools. Mm -hmm. Um, But Agatha realizes that even if they switch schools, they're not going to be allowed to be friends. And all she wants is her friend back. And um, there's one line that just killed me because it was Agatha realizing all Sophie wants is a prince. Mm -hmm. And she does not give a crap about her best friend. Well, and the prince that she's going after was the most flip-floppy, back-and-forth relationship. I was, It was constant, like, oh, you are evil. Oh, no, you're good. Let's be together. Oh, no, you are evil. Like, y'all, pick a side. <laughs> well, so he had trust issues. So yeah. um, can we just call him Teddy? Half the time they call him Tedros. Or how did you say it? Tedros, right? Something like that. It was T-E-D-R-O-S. Yeah, Tedros. I don't know what I was saying in my head, but Teddy's fine. They call him Teddy. <laughs> they also call him Teddy. Um. And Son of King Arthur, right? Yes. Yep. So if you think about Camelot history, um, King Arthur marries Guinevere. Guinevere leaves King Arthur for Sir Lancelot, and it's drama. And so King Arthur has died, and Teddy is just like, you know, my dad was so sad. It broke his heart. So he doesn't really trust women, but, like, he knows his whole goal in life is to save the princess. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of like confusion there and confusion because all these children have been told, you know, if you're wearing pink and you have beautiful hair and you um, are scared of spiders and you may or may not sit on a um, tuffet, you know, like all of these things, you're a princess. And if you like black and you laugh when someone falls and you fart in public, you're a villain. There's no in between. And so he sees Agatha and goes, she is evil. She should not be here. And they all ostracize her. And he he leads it a lot. Um, But he keeps seeing her do good things. And it's like, I can't comprehend. How is she doing good when she's so evil? Well, and he keeps also inadvertently, like, picking her during competitions and stuff. Yeah, so in the survival class, the... I forget if he, he was like a troll or a gnome or something. Little dude um, was meant to teach them how to differentiate good and evil when they look exactly the same. And so he would make like all the princesses into um, the same or prince, all the girls in the group, princesses and villains um, or witches, the same type of princess or the same shrub or, like, or animal or yeah. troll or something. Yeah. And, um, the boys would have to determine, the princes specifically would have to determine which was which. And every time he picked Agatha, even when she event- she was trying to like get him to pick Sophie. And I wasn't really sure the deciding factor. Like, were they just randomly pointing at something? Because they, were, they <laughs> weren't really doing anything. I think it was like he was supposed to get a vibe. Yeah, the vibe. Because there was the one where they had like the princesses or the girls in like the glass coffin Snow White style. Yeah, and so when they were in those coffins, Agatha's sitting there going, let Teddy pick Sophie, let her, like, these selfless thoughts of let her find true love, let her get her kiss as a best friend. And Sophie's going, let him pick me. I'm going to have the best castle. I'm going to have, you know, the most amazing life as a princess and a queen, and um, I'm going to host these balls. And I think he literally, like, felt these good selfless thoughts coming from Agatha and you know the opposite from sophie and was just like oh that's the good one obviously Mm -hmm. yep and then something happens where their places get switched and he doesn't realize that he picked her right yeah that was interesting yeah so agatha's constantly trying to get out of his way yep and she doesn't want to be picked and she doesn't care for him um and she just wants to leave yeah and they have these it's very video gamey. They have these, they, the score is the pop up above their heads yeah. once like a class is done or a competition is done or something. And if you get the lowest score three times in a row, you're basically kicked out of the school. Yeah. And I had texted you at one point when I was more in the beginning of the book and I was like, oh, this book's kind of messed up sometimes. And the part that was bothering me in a funny way, it's not anything bad, um, is the way the rankings work. You may leave the school when all is said and done as, like, top tier, you are the next princess getting your own fairy tale. Yep. You might be middle tier, and 
Maybe you're the princess's best friend, or you help help out help out in some way, or you may just be turned into an animal for the rest of your life. Or <laughs> a uh, so Agatha realizes this first, and she ends up in the like hall of good or something, and she to get there she had to climb a beanstalk, which was one of the children from her town. Yeah. So yeah, it I forget what they call it, but they say it straight out, like you know. This year determines if you're going to be, you know, a sidekick, a henchman, or no, a, a hero, a sidekick or henchman, or a, an object or animal, a plant or animal. And they say, like, in your third year, if that's your tier, we're going to prepare you to be in soil or whatever it, it is. It is actually insane. There, I don't understand how that's part of the school for good. I mean, I guess, you know, Cinderella needs her mice and Rapunzel needs her chameleon and they have to be... In some ways, it was kind of the explanation as to why all these fairy tale Disney creatures were like human thinking or could speak like a human or whatever it is. I was like, oh, this school is implying that they all used to be human at one point, which is why they always seem so human-like in the stories we read or, or watch. Yeah, so I get it. But it's also really sad. Yeah, it's insane. It, and it's not like they just dropped that storyline. There's a point where Agatha, Agatha literally accidentally figures out how to turn them back into their human form. And then when the animals realize that, they all chase after her. And she's like, oh, these were all literally kids at one point, And they all want my help. Yeah, so she goes to a class. Uh, I think it's called Animal Communication with Princess Uma. And... Princess Uma puts these fish in, like, a little bowl, and everyone puts their hand in, and the fish make a picture of your greatest wish. And for all the other princesses, it is one of the princes. and Except for Beatrix, who is, like, the mean girl, like, the Regina George of the school. She's, you know, top-tier princess, and she wants to be number one. And she puts her hand in, and it makes their whole wedding scene between her and Teddy, um, which was extra. Yeah, super and then, detailed. Yeah, and then Agatha puts her hand in, and she's trying to think of her wish, trying to think of her wish, and the wish she grants is she turns the fish back into a human. Um, and then, all, like you said, all the animals stampede, and it, like, puts poor Princess Uma in, like, shock, <laughs> and we don't really see her for a while. Um She's hiding. They tear down, like, a part of a building to try and get to her. But also, um, she tries to escape at one point, and she touches a gargoyle. And the gargoyle just is like, help me or Comes something. Comes to life, yeah. And she starts to unchange him. And and he's a little boy. And Teddy thinks she's in trouble, and he's a prince. So he stabs the little boy. <laughs> yeah, the gargoyle breaks. And it was like, oh, that was a kid. There were points where I'm like... What what was the age group again? Like, <laughs> yeah, so I did wonder. Um, I I think they're like 11, 12. But there are some adult, like, they're murdering people. They, they were 12 or just past 12 because they said once you enter your teens, your teens and onward, regardless of age, you get picked for the school. Okay. Once you were, once you were out of your tweens and, and all that stuff. But... So in the movie, they're... they're I mean, in reality, the actors are probably in their 20s, but they're all teenagers, so it'll be interesting if they age it up. I did see, by the way, um, there's no official trailer yet, but there's a, it's a Netflix movie. Yes. And Netflix put out, like, a, a sizzle reel of, like, things coming up, and there are certain clips inserted into that sizzle reel, and from what I saw, I was like, I would watch this all the way through, mm -hmm. since I don't plan on reading the whole series, but I'm curious enough to know how it ends, where I wouldn't mind like reading a wiki page, or if there's going to be a show, I'll watch the, the show all the way through. It looks really good. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. But on the flip side, for every competition that one school does, there's a an equal but opposite competition on the other. So where they had the fish comp there the fish situation, mm -hmm. the school for evil had the golden goose situation, yes, the golden egg. Which we <laughs> really need to talk about. <laughs> um, so I pictured the geese as like Willy Wonka geese. I literally did exactly that. Okay. That's all I can see. Um, so every child, in every villain child, goes up and they're supposed to convince the goose to give them a golden egg. And by convince, they can, because they're villains, 
They can bully, they can bribe, they can hit, kick, um, intimidate, any of those just, things. Yeah, just say something. Yeah, convincing. totally fine. I think um, Hester, who's the mean girl of mm-hmm. um, the villain school, I think she just like punched it in the stomach area and like got an egg. Yep. And she, I think she, it was like, you know. She watched everyone else and was like amateurs and like walked up. And, and was she like, was like the first and only one to do it until Sophie, right? Like yes. everyone else was like, oh, we are screwed. Yeah. Um, I think, or like the, the fastest. Because mm-hmm. I think other people like kicked it out. It might have been the yeah. fastest, yeah. And then Sophie, you know, trying to be a princess. She's sitting there going, because um, someone mentions that geese only, the golden goose only responds to people who are good. They only give their eggs to good. And Sophie's like, Psh, I got this. I'm good through and through. I am pure good. And so she walks up and she talks to the goose. And the goose says, oh, I will tell me your wish. And so Sophie wishes for her prince and her castle and her beautiful skin and the best dresses and balls and all this. And this is inside her head. No one hears this. Yep. So and they're it's unusual that you would hear the goose talk, period. So it's yes. already weird. And then instead of giving Sophie her wish, the goose kills itself. It literally turns gray and dies. Yep. And they were like, that is the most evil thing ever. It would rather die than do literally anything for you. Yeah. She got top marks, I think, even for not getting an egg. Yeah, she got a like a fire one above her head. Yeah. Um, and we get a glimpse that someone, it which is the schoolmaster is watching by the way this was the scene in the whole book that made me laugh the loudest i was like it would rather die than do something for you it was it was hilarious to me yeah i will be interested if they put that in i i'm gonna be interested in a lot of things because what translates in a kid's book does not always translate to screen for example killing a kid slash animal does not go so well on screen. That's yeah. not something a kid physically wants to see. So there's going to be some changes, I'm sure. Well, also, speaking of Sophie's evil streak, she... I forget what she does. Um, she, she and Agatha get in a fight when they're at lunch one day, I believe, and she throws a shoe or a rock or something, and it cuts one of the professors. Like, instead of hitting Agatha or whoever she was trying to hit, it hits a professor. So she gets sent to the doom room. No. <laughs> and in the doom room, so the school for good has groom rooms and they can, you know, get their hair done and their nails done. Very pamperish. Yeah. Um, and the doom room, you get tortured. Yep. And so there's a per- uh, thing in there called the beast and he looks at Sophie and she's terrified and he's like, this is going to be so easy, so quick. I can go get my lunch soon, you know, type <laughs> of thing. He's like in and out. This will be great. And so he grabs her hair and chops it off. Her long, beautiful, flowing hair. The one thing that really was differentiating her from everyone else, because everyone else looks evil, um, and she looks like a princess. And she cries. She starts to walk out, and she turns around, and she pushes him into, I guess, what is a pit? This will be one of the scenes I, I forgot about. I must have zoned out. So this is new to me. <laughs> so she murdered him okay. for cutting off her hair. It's a little extreme. <laughs> it grows back. And then like the very next edge. And that like was almost a turning point where she was like, fine, I'm going to be evil. Because everyone immediately treats her like, you know, oh, you've joined us now. Welcome. You know, like. And so the next day she like slicks back her hair and she makes her own gown that's made out of the villain outfit, which is black, tattered rag. This I remember. And she's like, if I'm going to be bad, I'm going to be real bad. I'm going to be so bad I'm good, and then Teddy's going to fall in love with me, and we're going to get married and have a castle and a gown and balls. Yep. So, yeah. And then apparently you can turn so evil that your just appearance changes. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that was a note that I thought was really interesting, but before we jump to that... I want to talk a little bit about the other characters. Yes, you'll just have to remind me the names because I did not write them down. Can do. So, um, look the... at you with your little bullet points and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, the schoolmaster, as we mentioned, is the person who decides who comes to the school. Um, and 
he is basically they tell they explain a story of um there were two brothers and there was some sort of war and one of like a great war between good and evil one of the brothers was good one was bad they don't know which one won and the schoolmaster is one of them and he is in charge of the schools and no one's ever seen him he's like this shadowy thing um but he's judging them all the time and it's assumed that he's the good one because the good school wins every year for everything. Yeah, they've been winning for 200 years. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why all of our fairy tales that we know in our world always have the villains, you know, losing. This book specifically takes place after every fairy tale you've ever heard of, period. Yeah. So they mentioned Cinderella and... Um, you know, all the classics. There were some I'd literally never heard of where I was like, I'll go with this. This could be real. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the point, though, was that they were also ones that Sophie and Agatha hadn't heard of because they were about villains winning. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were, you know, so-and-so the great. And you're like, who's that dude? And they're yeah. like, that's the, you know, the, the best sorceress since ever. And they're like, no one wants to hear about the best, you know. The best bad bad. guy, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, the schoolmaster ends up being super creepy. Just a little bit. He, um, again, this is jumping quite a bit, but he basically... He has his own tower. It stands in between both schools with a bridge. And the girls go there right away. Yeah, this was real easy. I feel like... No one in 200 years ever attempted this. (laughs) I mean, yeah, basically, like, Agatha realizes she can talk to animals or hear animals or something and jumps on one of the super scary evil bird things, Mm -hmm. grabs Sophie after the bird things try and kill Sophie because she's evil, and um, they throw themselves off the bird into the tower window and confront the schoolmaster. And they're like, send us back. And he's like, if you can answer my riddle, you're free to go. And he tells them this riddle. Oh, yeah, did they, did they answer that riddle? Yeah, the answer is love. What can a oh yeah. What can a hero have that a villain can't, or something like that? Yeah, can never have. Um. And so, they confront him, and when they go to confront him, they also meet the Storian, and the Storian is what is writing all the fairy tales, and. We hear about it a lot because, um, first, the girls try and, like, interact with it. Sophie's, like, bewitched by it almost. It's a... It's a pen. It's a pen or a quill, basically. It's writing on its own. And Sophie wants to touch it when they first fall in there, and it attacks her. And Agatha saves her. And immediately, the Storian starts writing their story. Normally, stories are only written once a hero has met their nemesis... And once um, they are graduated. Yeah, it's post-school. Your fairy tale should not get started written while in school. Yeah, so, and um, again, I'll be interested to see this on screen, but the the quill or the pen, it draws pictures of them, and it's supposed to be very beautiful. So I'll be interested if, you know, they're showing them fighting or whatever and and how the the story in is writing that that could be like cool it could be a cool scene yeah. yeah um but the schoolmaster supposedly doesn't influence what the pen does um and the pen kind of has a mind of its own and his job is to protect it mm-hmm. and so he that you know his whole time is in that tower and kind of playing god over all these small children yep <laughs> Yeah, I bet I'm sure in a later book we get more details, but I'm very curious to see. I'm I'm sure there's there's flashbacks or explanations between the two brothers' wars and what happened with the story and where it came from, stuff like that. So I did look it up. Oh, um, and there is it's on pre order right now, but it's the prequel, so it's the story of the two brothers. Oh, so this isn't done yet. Okay, yeah. okay. I mean, the main series is, but yeah. So there's I believe three books out right now, and the fourth book is coming. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then, of course, there are other, um, school children, and there are other, um, there, we learn about professors and things like that, 
Um, were there any school children or professors that like really stuck out to you? I wanted to be the one that could turn anything into chocolate. Dot. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a dangerous game, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dot, um, her mother is, I'm pretty sure, the um, Hansel and Gretel witch. And so that, you know, she has a gingerbread house and Dot's power or, you know, skill is to turn everything and anything. So, like, her textbooks are turned into chocolate. Yeah. I, it's either a kid says it about her own parents or she says it about her parents. So she's like, I would be so much better and smarter. I wouldn't just use a stove. Like, she had a plan of, like, how she would do it better. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Which was really interesting because the main side characters, you got a little bit of, like, you know, oh, my dad gave me this thing or, like, you kind of were able to figure out um, mm-hmm. who was who and, and which fit where. And that was kind of fun. The uh, This whole story um, reminded me of the show Once Upon a Time. Yeah. Did you watch that show? Not through, but yes, I've seen some of it. Yeah, that's I've seen it all the way through. It's one of my all-time favorite shows. And I think it's the best adaptation of telling anything fairy tales. But it's that same vein of like, oh, this is all post-fairy tales. We see... Who's the son or daughter of who, how they're related, and stuff like that. So, I, I like that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I, I always think that's fun. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not, you know, blatant of them going like, my mom's Cinderella. But, like, they just mention, like, oh, yeah, the mouse did this thing. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, and I think that there are some times when I watch or read something fairy tale, and I do not care at all. Mm-hmm. And it feels overdone and generic and then you get something like this which i enjoyed or once upon a time the tv show and this this was in a better category of fairy tale related things yeah um so one thing i wanted to talk about was at one point in the book what is fun in the book did you read it in print uh like physically uh, on kindle okay so i don't know if it was the same for you but in um the physical book they have, like, when they get an invitation, you see that it's a separate. Yes, I did event. have that. Um, and did you have all the pictures? Yep. Awesome. Um, I liked having those because it, they sometimes they were describing things that weren't real things. Yeah. And you're like, huh? But it's, like, the you know, on the front of the chapter or whatever, which was helpful. Um, but at one point, they're given rules for their kind of survival training, but it's also kind of for school. And... It's that the evil attack, the good defend, the evil punish, the good forgive, the evil hurt, the good help, the evil take, the good give, the evil hate, and good love. Um, And they use that from the moment they learn it. Um, So, like, Agatha really wants Sophie and Teddy to get together, so she'll say to Teddy, good forgive, you know, and, like, try and remind him, like, that's our rule, like, we should do that thing. Um, And... Sophie, for all her faults, that girl is kind of smart. Mm-hmm. Um, and toward the end, she convinces good to attack evil. But that means good is bad and bad is good. Mm-hmm. Because the evil attack, it's in the rules, the evil attack and the good defend. But she reversed it on purpose. Yep. Um, and so, like, I read that and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I took a picture of it fig- feeling like it meant something. Um, but then they used it throughout the book and, um, it became very important. (laughs) So, yeah, one of the biggest themes that isn't hard to figure out because they, they nail it home and say it a lot, but one of the biggest thing themes is that you aren't who you are. You are what you do. You are your actions, not how you look or what you were born into. And yeah, that's a, that's a really big theme of the whole book. Yeah. Um, so both girls kind of have a transformation. Um, I think Sophie's Some is more... literally more than others. <laughs> more serious. So in regards to Agatha, she takes a quiz or a test. I think it's 36 questions. And... <laughs> I forgot about this. It was kind of funny, actually. She answers it and gets 100%. And she's... And, and the question would be like, you know, at a ball, you see a mouse that's about to be crushed. Do you A, crush it yourself? B, stop the party and move it. C, find a prince to save it for you. D, you know, something else. Yeah, something on those lines. And she chose all the right ones, but underneath she would write, unless you're not going to a ball, then this does not apply. Like myself, yeah. Yeah, like all these very sassy remarks. She was was answering what she felt was right, but being very sarcastic about it. 
But then just because she is inherently good inside, she was like, oh, I aced it. Yeah, so she wrote 100% see me. And that was after the professor was like, all of you are choosing selfishly. Like, you shouldn't just be good to, you know, get a check. You should be good to, like, be a good person. And Which was Sophie at the beginning of the book, checking off those lists. Exactly. Um, and so Agatha's the only one that aces it. And the professor, I don't remember which one, asks her, like, you know, why don't you believe you're good? And she's like, because I'm ugly. And the professor's like, have you ever looked at yourself? And she's like, no. And so she blocks the door with her magic, puts up a mirror, and is like, check yourself out. Um, we find out she's the fairy godmother from Cinderella. And, you know, Agatha's like, no, no. She tries to break the mirror. She doesn't want to look at it. And then when she reveals herself as the fairy godmother, she's like, you know what? That Cinderella was like super, you know, that was fun. Let me do it again type of thing. She pulls out her wand and she's going to change her. The wand breaks. Don't Still don't know why the wand broke. But then they just did it like a teen movie from the t- early 2000s. Well, they, they different... needed more powerful, more power than the wand could apparently give. But I was like, wouldn't the wand be the most powerful thing? But okay. <laughs> but in the end, they didn't change anything. No, they... They gave her a makeover. They convinced her yeah. that she was going to be beautiful. They, they laid out like a trap almost, like... She awoke or was unblindfolded to like blonde hair cut on the floor as if it came from her or something, and there was no mirror, so she couldn't check herself out. So she was running to find the nearest mirror, and kids were like, "Agatha, is that you?" And she's like, "Oh God, I must be beautiful. Where's a mirror?" And then she finally finds one after all these comment uh, compliments, and she's just her. Yeah, she's just happy. And she's like, "People just saw you for you. You smiled in a hallway, and somebody noticed it." Like. We didn't change anything. No magic was used here. No. They probably, like, cut her hair, gave yeah. her a bath, <laughs> you know, yeah. put her in a new outfit. But, yeah, they, they you know, she, I remember thinking, like, how strange, because she's running, and she goes, maybe they gave me a whole new face. Yeah. But, like, no, she was just her. And I was like, that's the sweetest thing. And they drag <laughs> it out for a little bit. So I was thinking, like, well, what is the message here? Because if they changed her face, what is she going to do? Keep it permanently? Yeah. But, no, it was it was a good little fake out. Yeah, it was just her. But mm-hmm. happy. Yeah. People um, realize that she could she could look good smiling. Like Yeah. Well, in one of their first, uh, I think the first uh, class she goes to is about how to smile better. And her smile was just a grimace. And mm-hmm. like she like, it was like scaring the other princesses. So it was nice to see that come full circle. Also, I would totally be her in that classroom where she can't help but eat the classroom made of candy. Oh, yeah. It's like a temptation thing. Like, you you can't, you know, you have to hold back on your temptations. That's, what, that's why we make classrooms out of candy. And she's just like, I didn't have breakfast and I'm eating this. And I'm like, she's me and I want this classroom. <laughs> um, and then Sophie has a much more dramatic uh, dissension into ugly. But this is a question that I had because she starts to physically change her appearance the more evil she got. Yep. So I was thinking, like, well, is Agatha going to start looking more attractive because she's being good? Or she's already inherently good, so there's no need to change? I was just trying to figure out, like, if Sophie was already inherently evil, being more evil changed her? I thought it was a weird transformation. I think it was accepting that she is evil. Therefore, you become ugly, I guess. She, like, embraced it and was like... She she now wanted to make evil choices versus wanting to make quote unquote good choices, um, and she went from like kind of like emo rocker chick trying to like be the cool most powerful villain to hag very quickly, and I was very confused from like she was sneaking in and playing pranks. She was um, trying to get revenge on Teddy for not asking her to the ball or not being her prince or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's like putting lice or, you know, bed bugs in the goods beds and putting lice in their hair and all of these things to like mess with them. And at some point she goes from uh, rocker Sophie kind of cool emo to like old, Losing teeth, bald, shrunken hag. I don't know when that happened. Yeah. And I also don't know she somehow had the power during the... She hosts the ball and where she tricks the good to come and attack. 
she suddenly like looks like Sophie again. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit weird. It was a bit one sided as far as your appearance can change because you're finally embracing something. Yeah. So I was like, well, if if Agatha embraces her happiness and goodliness, will she look physically more attractive? But I guess not. No, because I think the point was Agatha was always beautiful. She just didn't know it. Yeah. I just felt like it kind of broke the rule of like if you, you know, one versus bit. the other. Yeah. But I was like, okay, yeah. Um. So eventually, because Sophie has tricked them into attacking, war breaks out between the two schools and um, the teachers have been petrified, and so they can't help. And the kids just start attacking each other and trying to kill each other. Um, again, these are like 12, 13, 14-year-olds, so it's a little crazy. Um, and uh, Sophie and Agatha both go to find or interact with the schoolmaster. And we find out he's a creep, creepier, creepy old man. <laughs> um, so Sophie climbs in the window and is like, I don't even know why she was there, to be honest. Do you remember? Nope. This this was the end of the book. I was like, time to get done with this. Yeah, so she climbs in there. I think she's like, I think she's still oh, asking him to switch schools. It was a trick. They, I know that it was a trick because... They were shooting the arrows, and then they tried to make it seem like somebody else was shooting the arrows, and they were trying to get them both up there to be like, boom, gotcha. Yeah, well, so, I don't know why Sophie got there, but Agatha climbed up those arrows um, with help from the villains. So, like... They were trying to show Teddy, like, oh, how how could Agatha possibly have done that on her own, or how could Sophie have possibly done that on her own? Well, like, that was in the ball. But then, at, at that point in the war, they were trying to help Agatha. They were like, yeah, go go kick Sophie's butt, basically. Hester and Dot, because, and Anadil were helping her. Because they kind of helped each other throughout. Then I don't remember why she was there. <laughs> but anyway, so Sophie is up there, and um, the schoolmaster reveals himself. Sophie went to write her own happy ending. She was going to steal the story in and write her own happy ending. Right. Um, because she'd embraced evil, she knew she was evil, and evil don't get happy endings. So she was like... I'm going to write it myself. Um, and he That is... seems like a mistake, because the last time you saw that thing, it literally attacked you. <laughs> I know. So he's in there waiting for her. He takes off his mask, and he looks young, even though he's 200-some years old. And he's like, I've been waiting for you. She's like, what? And he's like, you're my one true love. I, it was prophesied. I've been waiting for you. And um, she's freaked out, because he's like 200-some years old. And she's like, what, what? And he starts immediately aging again. And he's like trying to grab at her. And she's like, no. Um, and luckily Agatha has reached the top, trying to get to Sophie, hears it, grabs her, and they just kind of fall. <laughs> oh, yeah, out the window, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the schoolmaster does follow them and they fight him. Um, but, yeah, that was a really, like, you're an old man. You're like a really old man, and she's like a 13-year-old or younger. And the book ends with them leaving the school, right? Um. So Sophie and Agatha, basically everyone realizes that you don't have to be good or evil. Yeah. And you can be both. And um, my understanding is the next book is The School for Good Girls and Boys. That was my next question is, because this ended with them being like, we're not going to be here. So I was like, well, if they're leaving, the series is called A School for Good and Evil. So do they go back to the school? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that they, they might leave for a little bit, but I don't think that they leave, leave. Okay. Um, I think they help to, my understanding is they help to create a new set of schools. Okay. Um, but I do believe, um, so Agatha and Teddy are true loves. And Sophie is still got some evil in her. So I think there's still some dynamic of that. Yeah, and I'm sure Agatha and Teddy will end up together at the end. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's how it goes. But we'll see. Or, well, I, I might see. <laughs> I I will either watch it or read a summary. 
I don't dislike this book. I just don't feel the urge to finish it. Mm-hmm. But I care enough to know how the rest of the story goes. Yeah, I understand. Sparks that. Notes version. Yeah. Um. So, do you want to jump into ratings? Yes, I gave this a three. Solid, enjoyable read. Um, very hand wavy with the magic, low stakes, anything can happen. Just fun, nothing mind blowing, chill read. Yeah, you know nothing, nothing, nothing inherently bad. I have nothing truly bad to say about it. It is just a good read. I gave it a four. Um, I think my higher rating is because I am reading it with my son, and he really is enjoying it. Um, for everything he said about it, he's he is enjoying it, and he, we're laughing a lot. Um, that makes sense. And having you know fun conversations about it. So, um, you know, some days he wants to go to school for good, and then something else happens, and he's like, "But that's so cool! I want to go to school for evil." Um, that would make it more fun. Yeah. yeah. So I like that. And actually, I just found out there is a quiz, so I might let him take that online. <laughs> um, it's I think it's neverever.com or something. So. He's totally not getting to school for good. I'm telling you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun. I would recommend it. Um, the one reason for me it's not a five is that some of the themes are very adult for what is slotted for a young age range. Well, like I told you, I went into the book knowing nothing except its title. Yeah. I knew that it was a kid's book. I didn't know if that meant 8 or 14, you know? So when I started reading it, the way it came off was very, you know, silly. And then kind of weird and serious things would happen. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm giving this too low of an age reading. And then it would jump back into fart jokes, etc. And I'm just like, I can't figure out which kid is reading this. I mean, not that it has to be specified for any one age. As long as a kid can read it, they're going to enjoy it, I guess. But I was just like, there's a lot of weird mix of things going on here. Yeah, I think it's a a fairly wide range. Like online, it does say third grade to seventh grade. Okay, that's Um, a pretty, yeah. And so there were were pieces, like you said, that were oriented toward eight-year-olds, which is third grade. But then there was murder, torture, (laughs) you know, um, lots of, you know, the girls are obsessed with finding their prince and they don't really care about anything else. Lots of weird kind of themes that as an adult I can comprehend. I don't know that an eight-year-old, I just don't know what they're seeing, I guess, how they're perceiving that. So that's the only reason that I don't think I would give it a five. And also five is like, would read again. I don't know that I would read it again, but I am interested in the other books. Yeah. Decent. Okay. Yeah. So, I am very excited for our next two books. I... Which one are we doing next? Oh! Yours! Okay, yeah. So, the next two episodes uh, we're gonna do... It's still Buddy Read, still a main quest, but we are book swapping. So, I'm giving her a book that I've already read, and vice versa. What are you giving me? I forget the name. I don't have it written down. Um, it's called Carpe Diem, and it's by Autumn. I don't remember her last name. But I've read it probably ten times. Yeah, we're, we're trying to swip... We're trying to swap favorite books. Not like... like This isn't my number one book, but I wanted to swap something that I was kind of just like, you know, this this is top tier for me. Yeah. And I'm doing... I'm giving you Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. Which decades old now a lot of people probably know this story it's been audio drama it's been movified yeah. we've got everything like it's it's been an, it's been an all it's been radio showed very popular story douglas adams is probably one of the biggest names in sci-fi fantasy if not as an author in general um yeah. but and it's just fun i have seen the movie so i'm interested to kind of see the you know the written version of it um and Carpe Diem, I think as soon as you start reading it, you'll immediately go, yep, this, I get it, I get it, <laughs> um, because, yeah, you'll get it. <laughs> um, I think it's considered like a contemporary YA, but like, I'm pretty sure it came out when I was in high school, so. Yeah, nope, that sounds good. Um, any final thoughts? I think I'm good. No. So, as usual... Please rate and subscribe wherever you're listening. 
and check out our $1 Patreon. Get episodes early and support our show. Follow us at Paper Quest Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And leave us a comment so we know what books you're reading, maybe some of your favorite books for us to read in the future, um, and your thoughts on this episode. You can also email us at paperquestpod at gmail.com. And check out our Facebook. At the top of, the, um, at the top of our page is the pinned post with our full upcoming schedule now through, I think, September. Yeah, so you can read ahead, read along with us, and um, give us your, your thoughts as we're going through these books. We will slide in some side quests along the way. Mostly just the main quests are on the panda page. We we update it with side quests as we read in real time. So that will get updated in the coming weeks. Until next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.